Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm going to be uh, tasked with uh, giving a presentation today on uh, classification of AIS. It's a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at, uh, scoliosis in general and how AIS fits into that, uh, historic previous classification systems uh, focus mostly on the lengthy classification, how it impacts surgical decision making and planning. Uh, so scoliosis, just briefly, greater than 10 degrees of coronal deformity. If it's less than that, it's defined as spinal deformity rather than scoliosis. Uh, and I think it's important as I was preparing for this to, you know, as part of my review, to distinguish between idiopathic versus other non-idiopathic etiologies. Uh, AIS is the most common cause of deformity or spinal deformity or scoliosis in pediatric patients. And almost 80% of all, uh, regardless of age, falls under the definition of uh, being idiopathic. And you can see down at the bottom based on age, uh, there's some classification that you can start off with based on that alone uh, with uh, AIS or adolescent uh, falling between the years of 10 and 17 years and 11 months. So briefly, what isn't uh, idiopathic uh, is, uh, and so we start with neuromuscular, Here's a long list of uh, neuromuscular syndromes or diagnoses that have a high rate of association with um, the, the development of scoliosis. You see some, uh, at least from pediatric ortho, cerebral palsy, CMT, a lot of these are uh, myelodysplasia uh, and SMA are commonly seen, uh, at least in my pediatric training. Uh, and then looking at the uh, incidence or involvement. This is from uh, the SRS looking at the incidence of scoliosis uh, associated with these diagnoses. You can see myelodysplasia at thoracic level, it's up to 100, and uh, cerebral palsy, uh, lower GMFCS, uh, it's as low as 25%. But overall, pretty high rate of uh, incidence of development of uh, scoliosis with these neuromuscular diagnoses. And this is an, uh, a plain film I took from one of the textbooks that pretty classic broad C-shaped curve that's associated with neuromuscular scoliosis. And then uh, further subclassification, this SRS has broken it down into two kind of larger uh, broad subcategories of neuropathic uh, and myopathic. And many of the same diagnoses on that previous slide are here, but just sorted out in a different manner. So not to be confused, congenital scoli different from neuromuscular, uh, these kind of, these fall into two big buckets, failure formation uh, defined as a type one versus segmentation. Um, and this is based on you know, failure formation or the type one is, uh, is based on a preservation or failure to preserve uh, the uh, ability for longitudinal growth at the apoph uh, apophyseal end plates leading to development of wedge vertebrae or hemivertebrae. Uh, and this can be partial or either con uh, versus complete. You can see a cartoon example of this uh, on the side there. Uh, you impact, and it kind of boils down to partial versus complete deals with whether or not uh, the number of pedicles that are still intact. And then uh, to uh, contrast this uh, subclassification sub of complete failure of segmentation, fully segmented, say this, you know, this for the interest of what this talk is supposed to be about, I won't get too much into the weeds here, but as you can see, congenital scoliosis differs from idiopathic, uh, and this is one of the two types of it. There's also an addition to segment, uh, sorry, uh, there's also the failure of segmentation, which uh, similarly exists along a spectrum. You can have a partial failure of segmentation, which leads to a, uh, a bar, there's a complete failure, which leads to a block vertebrae. And then on the right, you can see there's also a mixed type picture, a bar with a hemivertebrae. And just some more cartoon representations of what that, uh, or sorry, uh, illustrations of what that can look like with the semi-segmented, fully segmented, and then on uh, the right, the failure segmentation as opposed to failure formation. And then finally, the mixed pattern. Uh, briefly, uh, again, what is not idiopathic syndromic scoliosis? Here's a list, uh, Marfan, Clip Clipophile, Ehlers-Danlos, uh, trisomy 21, Vactorol, trisomy 18. Uh, some of the uh, syndromes uh, that we get tested on pretty frequently, they're associated with developmental scoliosis as well, or syndromic scoliosis. Again, not to be confused with AIS. 
So now we've gone over what's not idiopathic, start briefly reviewing the different categories in terms of what is an adolescent. Infantile scoliosis, zero to three, uh, certainly a genetic component to this. Uh, important point for you know, initial workup is nearly 25% of these patients will have some sort of an intraspinal abnormality, so an MRI is crucial. Uh, key take-home points is that this can resolve even without treatment, uh, but 50% of these patients uh, can uh, progress uh, to a point of needing treatment. And of the idiopathic scoliosis, it has the most variable rate of progression, mostly due to the age of the patient and the uh, remaining amount of uh, longitudinal growth remain, uh, that still has to be done. Uh, and then briefly, infantile idiopathic scoliosis, the workup, abdominal reflexes can be an indication of uh, spinal dysraphism. Uh, important to look for uh, certain uh, signs of neurofibromatosis or other uh, syndromic conditions that can be associated with this. Uh, and the big you know, test point or takeaway for this is the rib vertebral angle, aka the meta angle. And you can see how that's calculated there. And uh, the point of this is that if you have a rib vertebral angle of greater than 20, it's an increased risk of progression as well as rotation and lordosis. Moving on, uh, juvenile idiopathic scoliosis is age four to 10. It's more commonly seen in girls than in boys. Uh, again, the idea being how much uh, growth is remaining uh, is a crucial point to all of this uh, in terms of uh, looking at the rate of progression and or the need for treatment. And it, with that in mind, not surprising that it's more likely to progress than AIS, but it's also more likely to respond to non-surgical treatment. 70% uh, of these patients require some sort of treatment. And um, notably these uh, untreated JIS patients because of that uh, likelihood of progression have a higher, they've shown in one study have a higher rate of mortality, both uh, compared to the general population, but interestingly also compared to AIS patients. Again, important to emphasize that's for untreated JIS cases. Um, this more or less resets or restates what I was just saying. Uh, can be successfully treated with brace cast. A curve is somewhere between 20 and 50 degrees. Uh, you've kind of two uh, bracing options for this. Uh, looking at either full-time versus nighttime overcorrection braces and uh, surgery, uh, usually indicated you know, can have growth front. They break down into two different types, growth friendly versus definitive fusion. Um, so now we've gone through kind of what isn't uh, AIS. We'll start talking about what is. Uh, AIS is age 10 to 18. Uh, in terms of de spinal deformity, as we go back to that definition above, Less than 10 degrees, it's equal, but the, for curves requiring treatment, uh, that number becomes uh, largely female dominant, 7.2 to one. Uh, in compared to JIS, again, same point over and over, less likely to progress. Uh, there, is, there does seem to be some sort of familial inheritance pattern, although the penetrance is somewhat, diff, uh, it, it's up for debate. Um, there's been a number of genes that have been associated or implicated in development of AIS. Um, and uh, these, uh, again, moving on, but here are some of the ones that you can see looking at myelination and uh, dyschondrogenesis, uh, cell signaling pathways, as well as some of these, uh, the muscle and spine pattern formation uh, has all been implicated where they've identified variations in these genes at a higher rate in patients with AIS compared to those without. So uh, workup, we're familiar with this, the Cobb angle, as well as uh, lateral bending films. Um, and I think it's important when you're talking about classifying AAS or kind of just the looking at these classification systems and how we're going to uh, proceed, uh, making sure we're all speaking the same language. And so the upper end vertebra um, is the superior surface of the upper end vertebra is, uh, is tilted maximally towards the curve. Again, standard Cobb measurement here. Apical vertebra is uh, the most deviated laterally and then the lower end uh, vertebrae is similarly uh, pointed toward this concavity of the curve, but it's an inferior surface of the uh, most caudal vertebra. Uh, and then neutral vertebrae uh, references rotation, uh, whereas a stable vertebrae uh, more deals with the vertebrae that's most 
closely bisected by the central sacral line uh, on a standing or AP or PA. So with all these in mind, uh, the King classification used many of these terms and it was looking at um, kind of defining and identifying uh, what levels to fuse when we got to a point of treating these patients. Uh, this classification was initially published in 1983, single institution, 405 patients, uh, pretty good follow-up, uh, average of four years. And they more or less looked at uh, what they had done for varying curve types and tried to break them down. And you can see here that the initial evaluation was they, they started looking at what they called the stable zone of Harrington. I probably should have put a picture of that in, but more or less it's both, it, it was two goalposts based on the sacrum. Uh, and the idea was that the uh, lower end of the fusion should end within this zone. They eventually ended up transitioning more to the, uh, what we see on, uh, or what we're using today, the central sacral uh, vertical line. And then another concept that they referenced in this that I thought was somewhat confusing in terms of calculating it, but the general concept makes sense is the flexibility index. Um, and that was more or less boiled down to the percentage of the curves, both thoracic and lumbar that corrected with lateral bending films. And that's the formula that was determined down there. And you can see the different types uh, with the most uh, two most common being type two and type three, but the other breakdown uh, seen over there on the right. Uh, and this is a further example from the paper looking at x-rays and kind of cartoon depictions of what this looks like. And you know, type one versus type two, the uh, lumbar is greater than the thoracic type one versus uh, type two thoracic is greater than lumbar. These are on static x-rays. Uh, and again, that flexibility index formula is at the bottom of the screen there. Type three is what they described as an overhang where the lumbar curve does not cross the midline. Type four, long thoracic, and type five is, uh, which I don't have a picture of here, is a double thoracic curve. And their conclusion is in their discussion, these were their recommendations. You know, type one, fusion of both of the curves versus type two, they introduced this idea of selective thoracic fusion. Um, and uh, type three, uh, versus type five, going back to those diagnoses of the stable vertebrae, uh, most closely bisected uh, by the central sacral vertebra, uh, vertical line. So problems with this that were identified, you know, the, the most important point with the King classification is that this was done based on Harrington rods versus uh, short, shortly after this was published, uh, there was a transition to pedicle screw or segmental fixation. Um, and it didn't address sagittal plane alignment. It didn't uh, include or address an isolated thoracolumbar lumbar curve type. Uh, and there were also uh, repeated uh, or a number of studies. One of them's here at the bottom, which I raised concern regarding intra-observer and intra-observer reliability of this classification system. So from all of these shortcomings or progressions of surgical technology, was born the Lanky classification. And in this paper, or in the paper, it was uh, specifically stated that uh, it was uh, kind of born from the quote, lack of a reliable universally acceptable system. Uh, looked at AP lateral and side benders. Uh, and again, looking at one of those shortcomings of the uh, late, or the King classification was demonstrated to have a high inter as well as inter observer uh, reliability. Uh, they broke these curves into six types with a lumbar modifier, uh, A, B, and C, as well as thoracic modifier, which you can see there. And here it is, but I think uh, important kind of dividing line between them is the type one through four uh, has a main thoracic is the major curve, uh, with meaning that uh, the, uh, not only is it the largest curve measured by Cobb, but it's also a, a room, it, bends out to greater than 25 degrees. So this idea between type one through four being thoracic as well as uh, type or versus type five and six being either thoracolumbar or having a thoracolumbar or lumbar component. Again, same idea, but on this table, I think important to emphasize a couple of uh, points here. The, uh, thor the definition of what these when, when someone says thoracolumbar curve, what does that mean? Well, 
You can see down there the apex falls be, uh, between T12 and L1. Lumbar would be below that and uh, thoracic would be above it. And another point that I think was made about the shortcomings of the King classification was that there was no addressing of the sagittal alignment. This was something that was uh, emphasized throughout the lanky paper in the classification was the importance of uh, looking at lateral views and evaluating the sagittal profile of these patients. And uh, you know, minor versus major uh, curves, um, looking, you can see down below there that the range, you know, in addition to that side bending cob is standard throughout, but specific regions, depending on which curve you're looking at, T2 to five for proximal thoracic, T10 to L2 for main, and then uh, T10 to L2, for uh, thoracal lumbar uh, is important uh, to uh, keep that in mind when you're assessing and determining whether or not a curve is major versus minor. And you can see those uh, thoracic uh, modifiers down at the bottom as well. So now that, again, going back to or the lengthy classification breaks these curves down into types one through six, but then there's these lumbar modifiers, which end up being very important in terms of uh, the recommendations about whether or not to address these curves, uh, the, the lumbar curves below. So lumbar modifier A, uh, in indicating a relatively mild scoliosis in that the uh, uh, CSVL falls between the pedicles. Uh, convert, uh, compare that to lumbar modifier B, where it's between, the, it's touching the medial border of the uh, concave pedicle at the apex um, and you can see here, if there's any question, they recommend choosing a type B. And then a lumbar modifier C is a more extreme or severe form of scoliosis where there's no contact with the apical body in the CSVL. And this is a table looking at the different variants that you can have based on these lumbar modifiers versus the, uh, 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 the six classifications of curves or six types rather. So I think a couple of the key additional points that were made in the paper itself that you know, reading it, preparing for this talk, I thought uh, stood out to me uh, in the discussion. They said, you know, we propose that when curves are assigned a modifier A or B, the lumbar spine should not be included in the arthrodesis except unless if there's a kyphosis. Um, and then we can compare that to lumbar modifier C, the spine should probably be, the lumbar spine should be included, but they reference down here, this idea of a one C or two C curve, if acceptable balance of the lumbar curve is maintained. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then uh, again, yeah, this another point that kind of segues into the idea of selective fusion. When a type cur five curve uh, should only include the thoracal lumbar region, whereas a type six, uh, they mentioned that both the thoracal lumbar as well as the minor main thoracic curve should be here. So these points from this initial paper were kind of transitioning to the idea of selective fusion. And so to go back to the idea of scoliosis and the definitions of major versus minor curve, regardless, any scoliotic deformity usually consists of a primary structural curve in addition to one to two compensatory curves, which may or may not be structural. In King, again, in those type two curves, reference, you know, kind of started getting this idea of selective fusion um, of the uh, S-shaped curves, uh, quote, to the level that is both neutral and stable using those definitions that I referenced previously. Um, and the idea of selective fusion is fusing one of the two of the curves that crosses the midline being either defined as C7 for thoracic or upper thoracic curves and CSVL for lumbar curves. And Lenke published a subsequent paper looking at this idea of selective fusion. Um, you, and the idea was that the, uh, for potentially indicated for those 1C, 2C, and 3C uh, type curves that were referenced in the initial classification paper, as well as the uh, primary major thoracal lumbar, uh, minor uh, main thoracic curves, uh, 5C and 6C. And so looking at the uh, selective thoracic fusions, he presented in this paper 44 patients where not only was the fused curve corrected, but they also demonstrated a two-year follow-up that the unfused compensatory uh, lumbar curve kind of self-corrected or reduced from 48 to 32. 
Uh, and similarly, looking at uh, patients who underwent a selected lumbar fusion for the 5C and 6C curves, uh, the major curve was corrected, but the unfused thoracic curve similarly kind of self-corrected. You can see down here at the bottom, uh, the radiographic criteria in this patient that were put forward is uh, whether or not um, looking whether or not curves were amenable to uh, uh, selective fusion. Uh, and this was based on a ratio of the uh, main thoracic uh, to the thoracic or to sorry to the thoracolumbar or lumbar curve um, and looking at cob angle as well as apical vertical translation. Uh, vertical, uh, apical vertebral, vertebral rotation, as well as the flexibility and the absence of uh, junctional kyphosis and the thoracolumbar junction. So that looked at the ability of this selective fusion to address uh, uh, the uh, non-structural or compensatory curves uh, from a standpoint of uh, radiographic cr coronal deformity uh, this was another study that came out of this that looked at the axial measured as the uh, residual rib prominence or lumbar prominence after these fusions and determining whether or not uh, in compared to the coronal correction was demonstrated on that previous paper, uh, there would be a significant correction of the axial rotation as well. Um, and this again was two year follow up and what their conclusions from the study were is that you could change a obtain a significant uh, spontaneous correction of the thorax uh, should, sorry, you could not after selective lumbar fusion, but a selective thoracic fusion resulted in an approximately 50% reduction in the lumbar prominence. So how do we put this, oh, sorry, here's just an example of a selective uh, thoracic fusion. So how do we put this all together? Because we're getting near the end here. Um, you know, the, applying this step one, is kind of identifying which uh, curves are structural using those criteria that were put forward in the lengthy classification paper initially uh, and select so where do we start in terms of UIV uh, it's usually the proximal end vertebrae uh, for main thoracic or thoracal lumbar curves for a uh, proximal thoracic T2 is the usual endpoint um, and if there's not a proximal thoracic curve there's some variability uh, in terms of determining whether or not you're know, looking at shoulder height, which one is elevated to distinguish or to decide where the appropriate ending point is T3 versus somewhere between T2 and T4. Uh, it gets a little bit more confusing from at least in my opinion, based on trying to prepare for this, um, you know, where are we going to end? Um, and we just talked about the idea of selective fusion um, for, uh, the idea for this would be that the most cephalad vertebrae, which is the one that's uh, would be the one that's touched by the uh, central sacral vertebral line for type one to two, um, uh, with a lumbar modifier A versus modifier B and C, the stable vertebrae can be selected as the LIB. Uh, and this is a very busy slide from a, a JAOS, um, which kind of boils all of this down uh, in terms of just selecting these. And I thought it was useful. As you can see, this is not just a plug and play, but looking over here at the LIV and uh, deciding, you know, you, you can go uh, N vertebrae minus one, depending on the appearance of the uh, bending radiographs and how much reduction is obtained. But I think that ignoring that kind of LIV, the idea of the selective thoracic fusion can be applied in the type one and type two curves. Uh, general landing point for the proximal thoracic is T2 uh, and, the, uh, and the distal end vertebrae, uh, more or less for type three through six or more or less the, the big picture take homes with these exceptions kind of worked out. So take home points, uh, AIS, again, go back to where this talk started. It's different from other scoliotic types. Uh, the lanky classification was developed uh, to address shortcoming, not only of King, but also other classification systems, uh, which were uh, born from the era of uh, non-segmental fixation. Uh, and the lanky classification was uh, developed with the objective kind of defining or standardizing uh, limits of fusion uh, based on uh, the radiographic appearance of AP lateral, as well as bending uh, films. But in spite of these objectives, as that last slide would indicate, as well as the 
number of papers that are referenced in that in that kind of JAOS article, there's still variability uh, with regards to truly coming up with a uh, systematic agreement about where to, particularly what the LIV selection will be for these certain curve types uh, among surgeons in spite of this uh, classification system. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. Thanks, Micah. That's a tough topic, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the big things back in the day was that we were the king allowed you to communicate some, but it didn't, it just did had nothing to do with treatment. I think that was uh, probably the big driver in the in the uh, in the room when those guys were developing the, the lanky classification. So this does kind of cover probably I bet 80% of AIS can be summarized in the basic generalizations that you made. It's the nuances that you're you're always stuck with, right? So it's the they even have sub modifiers to like that B plus now and B minus based off of a few other criteria that tell you to either include the curve or not to or to extend one level below the last touched. Um, but I, I would say I would agree with you that in general, the majority of the debate really relies on the the LIV selection, it's, it's still a bit of a, a conundrum, you know, because um, no one wants to fuse down the lumbar spine. Yep. Um, when you guys are out in practice, if you end up doing any of these, like if you're questioning whether or not to add one level or not, I would tell you always add the level. Um, it's, it'll take the pressure off you um, to try to get everything done within the levels that you're operating. So if you're selective, tells you T12, but you know, you're just a little bit unsure because like the last touched is like barely touched at L1 or it means I T12. Like man, maybe I should go to L1 because it seems to be more stable because the CSVL bisects the pedicles or whatever. Like that would be early on in your career. Like it's okay to, it's okay to extend things by a level typically because it's usually your, it's usually a, a matter of is it T12 or L1 or is it L1 or L2, which ultimately probably doesn't have such a dramatic effect on patient flexibility so just kind of you know take the pressure off yourself at the beginning and then as you do more of these cases then you you're always trying to shorten everything up um that's always the goal is to you know come out with the shortest fusion construct possible so. got it cool any other questions from the group Nope. Very good job. All right. 701. Nailed it. Thanks, guys. Hope everyone had an thanks, awesome guys. turkey day. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. And we'll yeah, thank see you. I'll be you tomorrow.